tonight to hear William Stixford, and we hope you'll continue to join us next week to hear Jackie Woodside, whose talk, Calming the Chaos, Productivity and Peace of Mind, is our uh, source fair lecture. This fair is offered each October in honor of ADHD Awareness Month. The mission of Virginia and DC chapter and Chad of Chad National is to improve the lives of children and adults who are affected by ADHD. Founded in 1987, Chad grew from a parent support group that was trying to change the frustration and isolation that children felt into leading nonprofit national organization for children and adults with ADHD. Today, ADHD is medically and legally recognized as a treatable yet potentially serious disorder. Nine percent of all children, approximately four percent of adults. Our chapter, one of the many chapters of this national organization, is dedicated to ADHD awareness and support. Chad of Northern Virginia and DC offers a free monthly lecture series on the second Tuesday evening of most months, not December and not the summer, but the other months we have summer. We also have support groups for parents, students, and adults. We have Hi, Cheryl. Accidentally, you're muted. There you go. I'm going to say that. Okay. I don't know. I had not heard of myself before. I don't know where we're up to. Um, did anybody hear anything? We heard you up until about talking about the lectures on the second Tuesday evenings of most months. That's where okay. I found out. Okay. We also offer individual support from your emails. While we are all volunteers, we cover other expenses, membership, dues, donations, and sponsorships. If you believe in our cause and have the funds to do so, we urge you to become a member if you are not already one. Tonight, we would like to take a moment to highlight and thank some of our sponsors. The first sponsor, is Pathfinder Coaching and Tutoring. Pat Hudak has provided ADH coaching to students, parents, and adults for over 15 years. Additionally, she is honored to serve as the President, National Board of Directors of Chad National. The next sponsor, the ADHD College Guidance Program, I'm sorry, the ADHD College Success Guidance Program is an integrated program of college ready, readiness success training, academic coaching, and mental health and career counseling. Their program is developed around their unique proven skill-based model for high school and college students who have ADHD. Their college readiness success training workshops teach participants life skills essential for college success, including executive function, increased motivation, life organization and balance, stress management, and more. Our next sponsor is Fusion Academy. This is a fully personalized accredited private school for grades six through 12, where classes are taught on a one-to-one -one basis, with one student and one teacher per classroom. Fusion offers on-campus or virtual homework cafe in addition which allows students to complete their homework in the middle of their school day, where students are full-time, part-time, or attending just for tutoring. Our next sponsor is Embark. Embark Center is a community of young people, ages 6 to 18, who prefer to learn outside of the confines of traditional educational environments. Learners follow a unique, personally designated path to pursue their passions and create meaningful lives for themselves. That is our last um, special sponsor for tonight. But next we have a list of our sponsors that are sponsoring all of ADHD Awareness Month, all of our lectures. And it's these two pages. And you will all get an email later with the slides 
from Bill Stixwood and also the sponsors. Now I'm going to introduce William Stixwood, who will be giving tonight's presentation. William Stixwood, PhD, is a clinical neuropsychologist and the co-author with Ned Johnson of the best-selling book, The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives. He is also a member of the adjunct faculty of Children's National Medical Center, as well as assistant professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the George Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. Stixrud additionally is a frequent lecturer on topics related to neuropsychological assessment, brain development, motivation, meditation, and the effects of stress, sleep deprivation, and technology overload on the brain. His work has been featured in publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Times of London, the Wall Street Journal, US News and World Report, Time Magazine, Scientific American, Business Week, Barron's, and New York Magazine. He is a long-term time practitioner of transcendental meditation and a musician who plays in the rock band Close Enough. I am pleased to introduce William Stixrud. Thank you, Cheryl. It's so nice to be with you folks tonight. I wish we, I wish we could be together in person, uh, but this is uh, second best. And um, so what I'm gonna talk about tonight and is why, why a sense of control or a sense of autonomy is so important for, for kids with ADHD and why we need to be thinking more about kids with ADHD than, than we typically do. Um, to think, think more about autonomy, the promoting the, the sense of control. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why a sense of control is so important in general. I'll talk a little bit about why it's challenging to, to, to develop in kids with ADHD, uh, but also ideas about how we do it. And, and, and again, why it's so important that we do. And first I'll say that I, I've been testing kids now. I'm a neuropsychologist and I make a living by testing kids and um, who are having social problems or attention problems or learning problems or emotional problems. And I try to figure out what's right and what's wrong and try to help them. And I never get tired of it. I still love doing it. And in part, because I just, I love what kids say. I, I just think, I just think of the other day about the, one of the first kids I tested in, in, my, in my home office um, in 1986. I asked him the first question on, he's five years old, uh, on, on, the, on the children's, uh, on children's version of, of vocabulary test. I said, what's a cow? He said, I can't believe you don't know that. And, but it's all, it, it's good. So in any case, Ned Johnson and I wrote this book, The Self-Driven Child, uh, primarily for two reasons. One is that we're concerned about what seems to be this unprecedented level of anxiety, depression, mental health problems in young people. And the, the, we see so many kids with, with what we consider to be disordered motivation. Ned particularly, Ned's a test prep guy, that does ACT, uh, SAT prep. And he sees so many kids who are just obsessively driven, you know, just panicked that they, they don't get into a, a lead enough college and are willing to sacrifice them, set their health and their brain and their family. To, to, and, and I see so many kids who are, have ADHD or learning disabilities and they aren't very good students and they figure what's the point of trying. And so they, and, and they don't work very hard. And so many of the kids I see with ADHD actually fight other people's attempts to get them to work hard. And so, and it turns out that a sense of control is, is very important in both these dimensions, the mental health dimension and the motivation dimension. And I, I will say that I have some slides. And I, when I talk about this topic for an hour or so, I just prefer to talk, but I'll send slides along tomorrow. That, that, um, so if you, if, you want, if you want them. But the first point I wanna make about the sense of control is just kind of what it is and what it isn't. And, and, and we think about a sense of control is having two dimensions. One is that subjective sense or agency or autonomy. This is my life. And basically I'm gonna get, get out of it what I put into it. So it's that subjective sense of agency or autonomy. And secondly, it's the, neuro, the neurological state that supports that, which is mainly where the prefrontal cortex, the most, the most recently evolved part of your brain that can, that can think clearly, go into the future and the past and put things in perspective, calm yourself down when you start to get stressed, regulates the rest of the brain, including the amygdala. So it's that sense of agency or autonomy, and it's, that, it's, it's the brain state that supports that, where the prefrontal cortex, 
regulates the rest of the brain, including the amygdala, that, that primitive part of your brain that doesn't think. It just senses and reacts to anything that's potentially threatened. And I think that certainly the sense of control is hugely relevant during this COVID pandemic because, um, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's really stressful. We, we experience such a low sense of control. We can't predict things and, and, and nobody knows when it's going to end. Um, Ned and I were doing a webinar in, um, in Seattle a couple of months ago and, and a mom put in the chat, said, I've, I've been fighting every day with my six-year-old daughter trying to get her to do her, home, her, her distance learning. Yesterday, she drew a picture of a meteorite hitting mommy. Should I be worried? You know, and it's, it, it's hard. Um, but it turns out that a sense of control is not only good for motivation and for kind of mental health, it's good for everything. And that if you, if, if you have a, a, a mother or a grandmother in assisted living and she's given the choice, do you want a visitor to come at 3.30 or 4? There's, there's little choices about, about her, her daily schedule. She lives longer because the brain simply just works better when you have a sense of control. And let me tell you what a sense of control is. It's two things. It's not, it, it, one of the opposites of a sense of control is feeling helpless or hopeless or passive, resigned. I mean, a lot, a lot of the, the, the kids, these, these really smart kids around the country who are committing suicide, people are saying they just feel existentially impotent. impotent. They, have, they have these really stressful lives. They don't know what to, they can't do anything about it. They feel helpless, overwhelmed. So it's feeling that hopeless, helpless, passive. But it's also feeling highly anxious, overwhelmed, driven, obsessed, because you think about it, I mean, if, if you're anxious, you have a very low sense of control. And if you're depressed, forget it. I mean, you can't get out of bed. You have, you have, you have no sense of control. And so, so the first concern is this mental health piece. And it, it turns out that um, there's a woman, there's a social scientist by the name of Jean Twenge uh, at San Diego State who pointed out in like 2007 that young adults, ad older adolescents and young adults in 2007 were reporting uh, five to eight times more symptoms of anxiety disorder and depression than young people were at the height of the Great Depression, during the Cold War, during World War II. And more recently, she, she wrote a paper in 2017 saying, I've never seen anything like the spike in anxiety, depression, and loneliness in young people and teenagers. Between, as, as I saw between 2012 and 2017. And there's some controversy uh, about whether or not there's actually more anxiety, more, uh, more rates of depression. What's incontrovertible is the incredible increase in completed suicides in young people. And so we're, we're, looking, we're looking at this a significant, significant increase in anxiety, depression, suicide, and, and these are stress-related problems. They're all stress-related problems. And even, even in five, five to 10-year-olds, we're seeing this, this spike in, in suicide, suicidal, suicidal ideation. And it's, it's certainly that being poor makes life very stressful, but also being affluent, as many of you know, makes life stressful as well, in the sense that, that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, published a paper in 2017 talking about the factors that contribute to these mental health problems in adolescents. And the first four were poverty, trauma, discrimination, and excessive pressure to excel. So excessive pressure to excel, you see in, in, in kids in these high achieving schools and in our affluent communities. And it was up there with, with, with trauma, poverty, and discrimination as, as a major, major risk factor. And when I talk about this, uh, when Ned and I lecture about this, and I talk about the sen talk about sense of control, people often ask, does it get better? Does this mental health stuff get better when kids are in college and they have a stronger sense of control over their own life? They have more choice over their own life. And it turns out it gets worse in college. I mean, the, the, the mental health crisis is worse in college. Which I'm saying this because so I, I, we feel so strongly that paying attention to this sense of control is one of the most important ways that, that, that we can help kids develop in a healthy way to be able to go off to college or whatever they do after high school and, and, and be successful and to actually be able to enjoy their success. And many of the people that we work with and many of the kids and many of the parents we work with seem to have the idea that the most important outcome of a, of a kid's childhood and adolescence is where they go to college. 
And from our point of view, the most health, health, the, the most important outcome is having a health, reasonably healthy brain that, that can be focused, that's motivated, that, that enjoys being in the present, that enjoys contributing, and isn't highly stressed and tired and exhausted all the time. And actually, so that, that's the kind of brain that can enjoy success. So we want people to be as successful as they can possibly be, but we also want we also want them to be able to enjoy their success. Now. Here's where the sense of control comes in. There, there's a neuroscientist in, in Montreal uh, who who's summarizes what makes life stressful with their acronym NUTS. And it's novelty, unpredictability, threat, perceived threat, and a low sense of control. And it's that low sense of control that's the most stressful um, thing. Uh, because you could, have, you could have the other three, but if you have says, I could handle this, it's just not that stressful. It's, it's when something's happening to you or your kid or, or somebody you love and nobody knows what to do. There's nothing more stressful uh, than, than that. And uh, the, 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 in terms of, of the, the brain, the, this, what I was talking about when the prefrontal cortex regulates the amygdala, the best marker of emotional resilience is actually the strength of the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. This is what we want to develop in kids. It's a strong, a strong ability to, to, to think clearly under stress. If something stressful happens, to, 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 to handle it well, to have your prefrontal cortex activate. And the guy who put the, this construct of sense of control on the map is a guy named Steve Mayer at the University of Colorado. And he, he studies rats. And he, he the, uh, the, Basic format of many of his studies is this. There's rat A and rat B. They're in a plexiglass cage. They're, they're tails outside the cage, and there's a little wheel in the cage. Rat A, his tail gets shot, and it's not real painful, but it's annoying, and he wants it to stop, so he turns the wheel. So rat A turns the wheel and, and discovers that the shock stops. Rat A has a sense, I can control the stressful situation. When he's turning the wheel, his prefrontal cortex is activating like crazy and dampens down the stress response. So it's not that stressful. So he just goes into coping mode. When he, so as soon as, he, as soon as he feels that shock, he, the, free, 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 the prefrontal cortex activates, dampens down the stress response. He's just coping. He's just coping. And, and even when you disconnect the wheel, it doesn't work anymore. He still just goes into coping mode. He's not that stressed. He just copes. Rat B turns the wheel. Nothing happens. The shock continues. Rat B does not learn a sense of control. Rat B becomes a, a nervous rat. Rat A, basically almost impossible to stress, but rat B, nervous rat. Steve Meyer says that is that, that perception of control inoculates you from the harmful effects of stress. And it's that, that sense, that, that, that experience of, of being able to control stressful situations that, that, that builds high stress tolerance, that builds resilience, and builds this confidence, I can handle stuff. And ideally, that's what we want our kids to have confidence that they can handle hard stuff. So that's the connection with mental health. Then here's the connection with motivation. When Ned and I were working on, on the self-driven child, we we're, were, were looking at various models of motivation to try to understand what, like, what's the secret sauce. And every place we looked, all the arrows pointed in the direction of autonomy. And probably the model that, that, we, that we use the most is, is called self-determination theory. It's a theory of intrinsic or internal motivation. And it holds that to, to, to be intrinsically motivated, you have to have three needs met for a sense of con a relatedness or connectedness to your, your, the, your parents, or your teachers, or your, your social group, or your, your coach. You have a sense of competence. That, that it's, it's, you don't really want to work on stuff very much if you feel like you're terrible at it and a sense of autonomy. And in this area, that's so many of the families we work with, and understandably, but they, they place such a strong emphasis on competence. If kids were doing really well in school and sports and building a college resume, that they, it undermines not only the autonomy kids have, but also undermines it oftentimes our relatedness, where, where we end up fighting our kids, arguing about the same thing over and over again. And so we, we love the self-determination theory. I, I was just talking with a girl the other day, and it was, she's, she's in ninth grade, and she said, it feels to me like my parents care more about my grades than they do about me. And they don't. I mean, they're, they're crazy about it. But there's such a strong emphasis on this competence piece. And we think about these three things as, as a three-legged stool, the competence, the autonomy, and the, um, 
and the relatedness, and we want them to be in a reasonable balance. We also just looked at, 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 at many of you know, Carol Dweck's growth mindset work. And so it's growth mindset, I get better through my own efforts, and, and fixed mindset, I'm born with a certain amount of ability, not much I can do about it. And the growth mindset's good for everything. And for our point of view, a growth mindset is nothing but a sense of control or autonomy. That this, this is my life, I get better I, through my own efforts. I can work at stuff and get better and better and better and better. And I'll, I'll tell you, there's, we also, there's a, a lot of individual differences in, in, in the way kids are wired. I have two granddaughters, one's seven and one's four. And, I, and I, you know, they have different styles. The, the, the older one is very dutiful. And one day uh, they're, before, they, for, before he went to work, their father said, girls, um, when I get home from work tonight, I, I, I want to do something fun with you. But first I want you to clean up your toys. So when they get home from school uh, the set that day, the seven-year-old seven said to the four-year-old, said, Miriam, let's clean up our toys so we can do something fun with daddy. And Miriam said, let's just do something boring with daddy so we don't have to clean up. And uh, so we'll, we'll see how that goes over time and uh, how that plays out. But the other thing I want, the other place we look to understand this internal intrinsic motivation was flow theory. And flow is this experience of being deeply engaged in something that, that's, that's not too hard and it's not too easy. It requires your full effort, your full attention. Often it, you, you'll see it, in, it, we experience it when we play tennis with somebody as good as we are, we play music, sex, uh, some things at work that, that require our full attention, where we can be doing something and it feels like 50 minutes went by, but it's actually an hour, that kind of deep absorption. And there's a guy named Reed Larson who studies adolescence. And, and for years he was studying how do, how do kids turn into self-motivated adolescents and adults? And he concluded that it was, it's not through dutifully doing their homework every day. It's through what he called the passionate pursuit of pastimes. And even, even then, we can talk more about this later if you want, if you ask me questions about it. But even there, even, even 15 years ago, he was saying, I'm not sure video games count in this. But the idea is this. When a kid is passionately involved in building with Legos or practicing his, his jump shot or pl playing the piano and getting better and better and better or completely absorbed in, in sports or dance or music or art, rock climbing, coding, whatever it is, the kids experience a brain state that's combining high energy, high focus, high effort, high determination and low stress. And that's the brain state. It's a perfect brain state to be in most of the time. And th th when I read about this, initially it seemed kind of counterintuitive to me that, that, that it's really these pastimes that build this motivational structure. And then I reflected in my own life. And, and, and I, I graduated from high school with a 2.8 grade point average. And I, I knew I only needed a 2.5 to get into the University of Washington. I still kick myself for having overachieved and spent all that time studying to get a 2.8. But um, I, I don't remember ever getting past page 50 in a book. I don't remember ever turning an assignment in on time. I was passionate about this rock and roll band I was in. And I, every night I'd tell myself, I'll do a little studying after I play music. But I, I just wouldn't. I'd, I'd go into a music room where I had a little organ and a record player. And I'd come out three hours later, having no idea what time it was, and kind of, where was I? I was completely engaged, completely absorbed in learning a song or, or, or practicing my instrument or doing something related to music. And when I started, my, my father died at the very end of my senior year in high school, and it kind of woke me up a bit in terms of, of I, maybe I should take school more seriously. And I started in college as a straight A student. And I, and I, I really think that part of it was that I, I sculpted a brain as a teenager through rock and roll, that once school became important to me, I was able to go pedal to the metal. I, I, could, re I, I could really work hard. And so I, I, I think that this, this makes a lot of sense. When I work with kids who are not very good students, they're that motivated for school, if they work hard at something to get better and better and better and better through their own efforts, and again, video games may not count, I can talk about that later, then I say, I don't worry about you. I think at some point you're probably going to need to take school more seriously than you do, but I don't worry about you because I'm confident that you're, you're going to be able to go pedal to the metal once it, once it does, because you're sculpting a brain that knows how to do that. And so I said I was going to talk about why a sense of control is such an important thing in, from both this mental health and motivational point of view. And I also mentioned I'm going to talk a little bit about why kids with ADHD, you know, that, that it's challenging to develop this sense of control. 
And the first thing is simply the difficulty. I mean, I, I remember seeing, the, 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 there's a guy, uh, um, has, uh, he used to have a clinic in Virginia, Daniel Amen, who may, maybe still does. Uh, and, uh, but he was one, he, he, one of the, his early books was on ADHD. And on the cover was, was brain, he did brain, PET, PET scans, or, or uh, what was it, spec scans. Yeah, this, this, this brain imaging. And what he showed was uh, the subtitle of the book was The Harder They Try, The Worse It Gets. And showed these, these brain images where the harder kids were, felt that they are trying to concentrate, the more subjective effort they're trying to expend, the less, brain, the less their brain activated. And certainly that difficulty with just activating your brain leads to inconsistency in, in your and unpredictability, which makes life more stressful. That the trouble getting yourself simply what to, to do what you need to do, as so many kids with the ADHD have, can, can, makes it more challenging to develop that healthy sense of control. And also, you know, we, we know that ADHD is marked in part by kind of low baseline devil, levels of dopamine. And dopamine being that, that, that neurotransmitter for drive. And one of the studies which in the book, we mentioned in the book, there's a fence and, and there, there, there's, it's, it's with dogs. There's a fence and one side of the dog is kibble on the other side is steak. And dogs with higher dopamine levels will jump over the fence to, to get the steak, lower dopamine levels, so, well, they figure out kibble's good enough. And so the low, low baseline levels of dopamine can, can also diminish drive and that sense of control, that sense of being able to, 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 to manage my own life. It's also true that impulsivity contributes to a low sense of control because kids, kids repeatedly do stuff that feels kind of out of control, things they regret. And, um, and th they're often told to stop, stop doing that when they can't, they can't make themselves stop. And, so, and also, kids with ADHD you know, tend to have more sleep-related problems than most kids do. And when you're tired, it really diminishes your sense of control. So there's a lot of reasons why, um, why ADHD, um, in it, just in itself, it makes it more challenging for kids to develop a sense of autonomy or control. It's also true that we, um, that, <clears throat> We use the, the, certainly the, the research suggests that in order to get kids to do stuff, to improve their behavior, get them to turn into schoolwork, uh, rewards and consequences are effective. But we also know from extensive research that rewards undermine intrinsic motivation. And so, the, the part of the challenge for many kids with ADHD is, is that they're used to responding to rewards and consequences in, in, in a way in, in, that's kind of what they're, they're used to, they depend on it. And it doesn't develop that intrinsic motivation. And certainly, we, 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 in many ways, we try to protect kids with ADHD from themselves through developing homeschool communication uh, uh, programs, whether they like it or not, through having them work with a, with a tutor or executive functioning coach, whether they want to or not. Um, we, we oftentimes, they, they, they take medication, whether they want to or not. Um, and, there's, when, I was, I, when I was working on my book, I was, trying to, I, was, I was looking for any studies that had been done to try to, on, on trying to promote autonomy in kids with ADHD. And I couldn't find anything. All I could find was, was a very new program at that time in 2018, a very new program by Margaret Sibley that, that's a therapy program that works with parents of adolescents with ADHD on promoting autonomy. But there's been very little effort to, to promote this sense of control or autonomy in kids with ADHD. Um, and you know, I also, also mentioned that, that part of the dynamic, part of what makes this hard, is that one of the ways that, we, that, that kids manage their anxiety about things is they avoid the stuff that they're anxious about. And if we, if, if we kind of kind of then move in and kind of we pick up the slack, it reinforces that avoidance. And so m many kids avoid their schoolwork because it may, partly because of ADHD, they can't concentrate, but partly because it makes them anxious. So they avoid it. So we, we try to intervene um, to get them to work. And they assert, they may then assert that, 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 that the need for a sense of control by resisting us, but by fighting us. And my experience is that kids with ADHD, like everyone else, they want their lives to work. They want to be successful. And I think that, that we're, we're, we're entirely capable 
of, of helping kids develop the sense of autonomy or a sense of control over their own lives. And I want to talk just a little bit now about um, uh, about some ideas from our book that, 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 that focus, uh, focus on that. First, I want to mention one thing I forgot, which is this Margaret Sibley I mentioned. Her experience was this, that the reason she developed this program was she, she's a clinician who has worked with kids for years. And, and she, she, she said in her experience, about 40% of, but by the time kids are 16 or so, about 40% of parents um, were basically burned out. You know, you're on your own, buddy. I can't fight with you anymore about this. Do your work. I don't care. And, and about 40% were still kind of micromanaging kids. And about 20% were kind of more supportive autonomy. Um, so it's hard. It's hard. And I think that, um, that uh, it's hard, but, but it's doable. And so I want to tell you about some experiences very early in my career that, that started to shape my thinking about promoting autonomy. And the first is this. Um, I just noticed just in the first few, few years of my, my, my practice, how often parents said something like, God, I dread dinner time, because after dinner, it's three hours of World War III trying to get my kid to do his homework. And I, I learned in 1986, two years after I started my practice, that homework doesn't seem to contribute to learning in elementary school. I thought, what's all this fighting about? But also, um, I'd, I'd, I'd work with underachievers, I always have, and I'd say, if you don't turn in an assignment, who's most upset? And it almost invariably, the kid would say, my mom. And then I just I'd use a family therapy technique and said, who's next most upset? And the kid would say, my dad, then my teacher, then my tutor, then my therapist. And the kid was never on the list. Or I go to a school meeting. Like I, I went a couple of years ago, but all my career, I've gone to school meeting. This one a couple of years ago, eighth grade boy, Catholic school. Um, I, I just tested him and he had, he had language disorder, learning disabilities, and ADHD. So school wasn't easy for him. And he, he was applying out like his, like his fellow eighth graders to, high, to Catholic high school. So there's tremendous pressure on getting to do better. So I go to this school meeting and, and one of the learning specialists says, it takes two learning specialists, a tutor, and the mom on top of the kid all the time in order to get him to do any work. And I said, St stop immediately because this won't change until the energy changes. If you're spending 90, 90 units of energy trying to get him to work, he'll spend 10. If you get more anxious and go up to 95, he'll spend five. And th that story actually has a nice ending. I may tell you about it a little bit later, but because um, they, they did, they changed the energy. Also, the, the, in my first job at Children's Hospital, uh, in my first year of my practice, in the first year of, of my career as a neuropsychologist, I tested these two kids with ADHD. One was a seven-year-old girl in the same week. One was a seven-year-old girl. One was a 19-year-old boy. The, 17, the seven-year-old girl, when she got home from school, she just felt, I need to do my homework. So she sat with her mother. She needed her mother's help to do her homework. She had, to, she had ADHD. But she sat and did her homework, and then she went and played. And the 19-year-old boy had spent much of his, his, his time in high school resisting other people's attempts to get him to work. And he goes off to college, and not surprisingly, uh, flunks all his classes the first semester. He's on academic probation. I see him early in the second semester. And I meet with the parents and they say, he's really turned it around. He's, he's, going, to, he's going to his classes. He's meet, meet, meeting with his professors after class. The kid says to me, I haven't been to cl class in three weeks. And I asked myself, God, even then, I said, it, 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 it can't be a matter of brain maturation, maturity. She, he's 19, she's seven. And what struck me is I, I think it was a matter of th that she had an accurate model of who's responsible for what. She perceived her work to be her responsibility, and he, he perceived it to be his kind of responsibility to make sure that people don't get him to do too much. And also, um, so this idea of who's responsible for what um, was, was really important to me. And also, one of my friends 30 some years ago, who's also a neuropsychologist, did a certain kind of psychotherapy training. And the therapists were told, don't work harder to help your clients solve their problems than they do because you're going to weaken them because you're, they're going to end up thinking that somehow the source of, of the solution to their problems is within you, not within them. And over the, the last 30 some years, I've taught hundreds of tutors to work with kids with ADHD and learning disabilities. And I've always said, if it feels to you like you're working harder to help the kid with his reading or his, his, his work production or whatever you're working on, tell him, I, I don't, I don't want to weaken you. So I, I, I don't want to work harder than you do. Uh, and if, if I do, I'm going to weaken you because you're going to think somehow I'm responsible for you getting better at this. And I want to do anything I can to help you, but I don't want to 
I don't want to weaken you. And almost invariably, when the tutors change the energy, the kid steps up to play. So the first thing I want to suggest is this, that in 1986, based on these experiences, the early experiences, I wrote an article in Calls Magazine on how not to fight with your kid about homework. And I said, tell your kid, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. Fighting about the same thing over and over again is always toxic. And also, you're the most precious thing in the universe to me. I don't want to fight with you. And also, I, I don't want to act like somehow I'm supposed to be able to make you do your homework. I mean, all, all, I couldn't make you. All, all you have to do is flop in the floor. What, what I'm going to do, prop you up, prop your eyes open? I couldn't make you do your homework. Also, if, if, if I act like it's my responsibility to get you to work, I'm going to weaken you because I'm going to reinforce the idea that I'm responsible, not, not you. And I want to do anything I can to help you. I'm willing to be your homework consultant. I'm willing to, to set my consulting hours from 6.30 to 7.30 every night. I'm willing to sit with you do, while you do your work. I'm willing to go on, online and find out what your assignments are, whatever it is. But I don't want to weaken you. And I'll just say that, that, that one of my clients, uh, when my first book, came, my book first came out, she uh, sent me an email and said, I just told my eighth grade son who had ADHD, I love you too much to fight with you. And first he smiled and then he hugged me. And then he said, is something wrong with you, mom? So apparently they've been fighting more uh, about that. Um, so let me tell you the implications of this idea. This, this idea of thinking about as a consultant to your kid rather than the kid's boss or the man or manager or the homework police. So this idea of parent is consultant. And I love this idea. As kids start to get older, we think about ourselves more as a consultant to help our kids figure out their lives and how to manage it and how to direct it than the people who always know best or people who are always in charge. So um, the first, there's four implications of this idea of parent as consultant. And the first one is this, is I believe that we should offer kids help and not try to force it down their throat. And that means tutoring, it means homeschool uh, coordination program, you're signing off on their homework every day. If kids fight that stuff, I, I, I say, and, and unless the kids are completely out of control, I, I say, don't, don't, let's not force it on them. Let's, let's treat them like they're, they're intelligent and say, if this doesn't, if this doesn't help you, but let, let's not do it. So it, it's offering help. And, and I, I did this with my own kid with ADHD, and, and I, I've, I've counseled parents for 30 some years to, 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 to not force help on kids unless they're out of control or unless they're incredibly depressed or they're, they're just completely wild behaviorally. Uh, that don't force help on, on, on them that they don't either want or think they need, because then they just fight our attempts to, 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 to probably to do what's in their own be best interest. And, you know, I, and with the medication piece, you know, this ha it happens a lot where parents will call and ask if I'm willing to kind of talk to talk a kid into something. And, and uh, about, about a year ago, a mom called about another eighth grade boy in a Catholic school who was getting straight C's applying out to the high schools. And he'd been diagnosed when he was in second grade with ADHD, but he's, he'd refused all these years to take medicine. And apparently his pediatrician had, had, had come to Jesus meeting with, with, the, with this kid the year before and said, you need to take this. This is so important. And the kid refused. So, my, so she called my wife and asked would, would I talk him into it. And, and, uh, and my wife said, he doesn't believe in doing that, but he'll talk to the kid about it. So I meet with this kid. And what I do is I say, I don't want anybody to try to force you to take this medication. I said, you're, you're a smart enough kid to figure out the, the, your, your, your life. And, and, and I said, also, if somebody tries to force you, all you got to do is you can put the pill in your, in, in your cheek and, and pretend to swallow it and you go spit it out. I don't want anybody to force you. But I want you to make an informed decision. It just seems to make sense to me that, that there are kids who, for whom these medicines are life changing. And it, it seems to me it would be worthwhile for if, if you know that nobody's going to force you to take it to try it out and just see what it does and then decide. Because if it doesn't help you, you aren't going to take it. And if it's bad side effects, you aren't going to take it. If it helps you 20%, probably not worth it. Uh, and, but if it really helps you, you can decide whether to take it or not. This, this kid started the medicine a couple days later. And, and literally, I mean, he was, he's one of these kind of turning on a light bulb kind of thing where he's getting straight A's two months later. And, but my point is simply that... <laughs> That we want to resist the, the, the attempt to, to, to force, to force help. Also, we want to offer our advice 
our experience, our wisdom, but not trying to force it down a kid's throat. And in one of my favorite cartoons, Ned has this cartoon where dad has the, his two sons by the nape of the neck. He's saying, listen up boys and listen up good because I'm going to tell you this a million times. You know, and, and I, so, so many parents tell me, I, I've told them a hundred times. Well, you don't tell them a hundred times. Look, look for buy-in. Look, look for buy-in so that, that we, we, um, we say, you know, I, I got an idea about that. Can, can, I, can, can I run it by you? Um, that, you know, I, I, I'm wondering whether this might help. And, and where, where we kind of tentative, you know, for whatever it's worth, you know, I wonder if this, we, we like that as opposed to, to try preaching at a kid or, or, or raising our, continually raising our voice to try to get the message across to, to, to kids. So we want to offer, we want to offer advice we, we, in our wisdom and our experience because kids need it. But if they aren't buying it, we're, we, want, we want to look for buying. You know, one of, one of my colleagues went on moved to Florida, sent me a card that said, I want to give you some advice that my mother gave me because I sure as hell won't be using it. You know, and we want to look for the, that, that openness. And, and I was lecturing about this in New York a couple of years ago. And a mom said, my, my kid's in a boarding school for, for kids with learning disabilities. And she's 15 years old. And we talk on the phone three or four times a week, three or four times a week. And every time we, we it turns into an argument because she brings up a problem. And I say, well, you need to do this or this or this. And the kid fights back. And then it just devolves into an argument. And so she starts reading this book. And, and, and so last week when she called, I, I, um, the kid brought up a problem. I said, is there a way that I could help? And she said, the, it, it changed. Then it was fun to bring something. Then, then I, could, I could offer an idea. And it, we, we thought of it together. I wasn't trying to force it on her. So it's, it's, it's offering help. It's offering our advice, not trying to force. The third thing is encouraging kids to make decisions and for teenagers, requiring them to make decisions. And th th this becomes tricky uh, because, um, because certainly we know that kids with ADHD, the prefrontal cortex is somewhere between three and five years less mature than kids without ADHD. And so many parents understandably think, how could I let him make decisions? Well, the thing is, I mean, here, I had this experience early in my career, and this, this may sound crazy to you, but um, it was very common early in my career for kids in first and second grade, kindergarten and first grade, to repeat a grade in the public schools. And I'd see, I'd see a 19-year-old, I'd say, well, where are you in high school? Or, where are you in school? They'd say, well, I'm a senior in high school. I should be a freshman in college, but my parents made me repeat the first grade. They're still pissed about it 12 years later. And so what I started to do is say, let's tell the kid, Nobody's going to make you repeat the grade. And, and, and so nobody's going to force you. You get to make the decision. But I want you to make a good decision. So I want you to talk to Dr. Stickshrood and talk to your teachers and your, your aunt Sally. She's a teacher. And see if you, and what I found and this is that these six and seven year old kids, because they thought about it all summer, they could make a decision as, that was as good as I could make for them. And I'm not suggesting that six and seven year old kids with ADHD make all their own decisions. I'm just suggesting that you don't want to send a kid off to college until he's had plenty of experience running his own life. And part of running their own life is making decisions. And they get better at decision making through being entrusted to make decisions. And I felt my whole career that the best message you can give a teenager is, besides I love you and I'm crazy about you, is I have confidence in your ability to make decisions about your own life and learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have a ton of practice doing that before I send you off to college or wherever you go off to after high school. And I think with little kids, the message is you're the expert on you. And, and you want to do it this way or this way. And let them pick out their own outfit when they're in preschool. And as much as we can, express confidence in their ability to make decisions about their own life that we don't always know best. I mean, I, for the, I, I, my first experience in graduate school, I was in a PhD, PhD program in English literature. And I went for 20 straight weeks without turning an assignment. I was just too anxious and insecure. <laughs> when I work with underachievers, I say, 20 weeks, nothing. Top that. Uh, but my point is simply this. When I flunked out of graduate school the first time, I, I felt my whole life, I, I, I felt like I had screwed up, my whole, screwed up my whole life. Everything went up in smoke. It took about two months for me to realize it was the best possible thing that could have happened. There's no way I should have been an English professor. Uh, psychology is much more my thing. So in any case, I, and, I, and, and kids oftentimes, something seems like a disaster a year later or six months later or six years later, they're, oh my God, that, that opened up this door that we wouldn't have otherwise been open. So this, it's the decision-making. And the last thing 
is goes back to this idea of the way kids become resilient and, and be able to tolerate and function well in stressful, stressful situations is by managing stressful situations. So as much as we can, if kids have a problem, we want to ask, remind ourselves, whose problem is it? And out of love and respect for the kids, it's their problem, which simply means that we're available to help, but we don't jump in and try to solve the problem for the kid. We ask ourselves, remind whose problem is it? And we, we, we can, again, we go into problem solving mode if we need to, if, if we're asked. But as much as possible, we want kids to have that experience if something stressful happens. Their prefrontal cortex activates, dampens down the stress response, and they go into coping mode because that's what develops that confidence that they can handle stressful situations. Now, I want to tell you too uh, about another construct in the self-driven child that, that is really useful in terms of promoting the sense of autonomy or control. And uh, it's this idea of a non-anxious presence, a non-anxious presence. And I didn't make this term up. I wish I did, but I didn't. And it's made up by a guy named, by the name of Edwin Friedman, who was a rabbi and a family therapist and consulted with organizations, with ranging from families to, to corporations. And it has, his message, one of the basic, basic messages was this, organizations work better if the people in charge are not highly anxious and emotionally reactive. And you think about it, if you've got, a, if you've got an infant who's crying, it's much easier to soothe them if you stay calm. Also, if, if you've got a two-year-old or three-year-old having a tantrum in the store, you're much able to handle it, you handle it much better if you stay calm. Or you've got a 15-year-old boy who's really upset because he just flunked a test or his girlfriend just dumped him, much easier to really be helpful if we stay calm and don't get, get upset ourselves. And we know that stress is contagious. We, we, we pick up other people's stress being in, in, in this same room. Um, and uh, give, give me three seconds. Thank you. Um, my wife's doing dishes in the next room. <laughs> Feel a little quieter. So in any case, um, that uh, that if we're, if we're with the room, same room with somebody who's really stressed, then, then we, uh, we we get sweat, we feel stressed ourselves. Also, we can radiate if we radiate calm, the, the kids pick that up too. And, and so we know some of the, the really interesting studies uh, by one of the great psychologists in the world, Michael Meany. In, in, in classic studies, he separated rat pups from their mother, and the mothers have to be high licking and grooming, not, not terribly anxious, and, and, and pretty laid back um, uh, rat pups, rat mothers. And the pups were separated from their mother for 15 minutes twice a day and then returned to the mother. And uh, this experience for two weeks, the first two weeks of their life, very stressful being separated, lots of nurturing, mother licked them and groomed them when they, when they, when they, when they, when they got back. And these rats who had this experience of being stressed and then, then soothed, stressed and soothed, they became what the researchers are called California layback rats because they are almost impossible to stress. Now, if they're, if they're separated from for two hours at a time, it was just so traumatic that, that everything went south. But that 15 minutes of short periods of having to deal with stress themselves then being soothed and, and, and restored was really good for the nervous system. Also, Meany had a colony of high licking and grooming rats and low licking and grooming uh, rat mothers. And he fostered offspring from the low licking to the high licking. So from the anxious to the, to the non-anxious. These rats also became California laid back rats, um, even though they're genetically programmed to be anxious. So there's a lot we can do. And it, to, to, if, if we, and I, we just like this idea of moving in the direction of being a non-anxious presence in our families. And uh, just one of my friends who teaches uh, Transcendental Meditation said he's been getting uh, uh, calls from people who, who apparently have read The Self-Driven Child saying, I want to be a non-anxious presence in my family. And some of the ways we suggest in our book that we do this are, one, is taking a long view. And for kids with the ADHD, this, this, is, I mean, this is so important. And, and by far, the most useful thing I ever learned about the brain was how slow the prefrontal cortex develops, where the, the, the cognitive function is not mature, 25 plus minus three, ADHD is gonna be plus three, the emotional regulation functions, 32 plus minus three. And just knowing that, I, I learned this in 1992, how, how, how much development happened in, in young adulthood. And I was able to reassure so many parents to take this long view, 
that the kids are going to be completely different from 17 to 20 to 23 and 26. And just this last Christmas, I got two Christmas cards and, and, and what, uh, well, I got <laughs> two of the Christmas cards I got. One, one said, you were right. And inside, it was, it was about these three kids in, in this family that I, I followed the kids starting in the 19, kind of mid-90s. And I'd, I'd followed all three for several years, but I hadn't seen any of them for, for at least 10 years. And the, the parents just said, I just wanted you to know that you, you kept saying, as, as their frontal cortex matures, they're going to be fine. He said, they're, they're all terrific. And one of them had, had, had flunked out of college, had been suspended twice from college because he just had depression, couldn't get himself to go to school. He's a very successful attorney. So one is that is we take a long view and, and, and all of our fear as parents, it's about kids getting stuck in some negative place and not getting back. Because if I, if I could say to you, I've seen a thousand kids going through what your kids gone through and they all turn out great. You wouldn't worry about it. It's that, it's that fear that somehow that, that they're gonna get stuck. So it's taking a long view and also simply enjoying a kid is really a, a tremendous way to, 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 to lower our unstress level, just, just to set our focus. When I used to do therapy with kids and families, if, if, if parents were butting their heads a lot with, with, with kids or, or there, there's problems in the relationship, I'd say, let's, let's set our highest goal of simply enjoying the kid so the kid starts to experience himself as a joy producing organism as opposed to a frustration or anxiety producing organism. And so we work backwards. What, what's keeps you from enjoying it? It may be bad marriage or it may, may need some work or maybe I need better behavior management or uh, I need something. But that being enjoying, being able to, is, being enjoyed is, is huge. Certainly practicing stress management is a very good thing. Uh, we talk quite a bit about, about meditation in the book, which we think is a really important tool for stress management, particularly given the incredible uh, uh, pace at which technology is developing, how little we rest these days, how incredibly stimulating and addictive these technologies are, needing opportunities to really quiet our brain, quiet, quiet our mind, and experience some inner peace. And I'll just say that one of my favorite cartoons is it involves a father who is not a non-anxious present. And it's these two teenage boys and they're walking. And, and one, one says, God, I'm just so sick of my dad. He's constantly on my back. He's constantly telling me, get, get those grades up. Last night, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, get that salary up, which I, I've, always, I've always liked that perspective. Um, so this, this non-anxious presence is, is a good idea. And also, there's a construct in our book called what we call radical downtime. And the idea is that life has become so fast paced and the balance between rest and activity is so far out of whack where we sleep so much less, we have, we have we, uh, we, everything is so fast paced, we're, we're constantly plugged in, yeah, yeah. we need more radical forms of downtime. It, it, it can't be just be playing golf or knitting, it, that, where, you're, where you're actually, looks like you're doing nothing but what you're doing is really important for your brain and body. And, and, and so the three things we include in radical downtime are, are, are daydreaming or mind wandering. And certainly a lot of kids with ADHD, they, they get enough of this. Um, but, um, but even intentional periods of just where, where, you, where you're unplugged and you have time to, to think about your, your, your life because we know that these periods of daydreaming and mind wandering are really highly associated with, with creativity, with problem solving, and with children and teenagers, the development of a coherent sense of identity and the development of, of, of empathy. So it's, 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 built, it's not having kids be constantly scheduled, not overly scheduled. Meditation, which I talked about, and I will mention my experience is that, it, that it's not easy to get kids to meditate for most of them. When they do it, they get the same benefit adults do. And I actually, I actually did two studies a few years ago on middle school kids with ADHD practicing transcendental meditation, 15 minutes in school twice a day in, in special education schools, um, one in Maryland, one in DC. And we, we got beautiful results in terms of behavior changes. We were our second study, we got these beautiful changes in brainwave activity. And we, the, the first study, we interviewed the kids after, this, after, after three months of meditation. And they all said, I'm much less anxious. Most of them said, I'm better organized. I can do my homework better by myself. This one kid who was wildly impulsive said, before I started meditating, if I was walking in the hall and somebody bumped me, I just turned around and hit him. 
And then I've been meditating. If I'm walking in the hall and somebody busts me, I stop and think, should I hit him or not? And we figured that this is pretty, this, this is pretty good progress here. So this radical downtime uh, is, is an important idea. And also I'll just mention, there's this kid who, uh, his mother is very wealthy. He has, he has autism, a teenager, and he has a mother learned uh, uh, TM, transcendental meditation. And uh, the, the, the mother, he, he, his, his, his autism improved a lot. And the mother got the press involved. And, and a reporter said, so son, um, what, do you notice, what, what do you notice from meditating? He said, TM calms the mom, it calms the mind, and it calms the mom. So I, I think that there's many things that, are, if you're an exercise person, walking, walking in nature, there's many ways that, that we can reduce stress. But we think that these periods of, of radical downtime, the daydreaming, the, 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 the meditation, and sleep, hugely important. And, and you, you could not, you could not overestimate how important kid, the development is sleep is for kids' development. Many people think it's the most important thing for brain development. I personally think that the two most important things for kids' development are working hard to get better and better and better at least one thing that's important to them, and two, sleep. So in any case, the, the last thing I want to mention is this. Um, I, I want kids to have an accurate model of reality. And I think with kids with ADHD, it really helps them to understand that, that uh, that growing up in this area where we have this, so, so many kids have this idea that it's either Yale or McDonald's. So many kids by the time they're in ninth grade are terrified that they, uh, that they aren't going to get into a good enough college. I, I tested a second grade girl with ADHD a couple of years ago. And I said, I said, is there stuff, is, I did in my interview with her, I said, is there stuff you worry about? And she said, well, I worry about my grades because I know they're going to contribute to my, they're going to be important for my college. And I want to go to a good college. And I'm thinking, oh God. And she said, and then she went and said, I, I want to go to a good college like American University because they have an elevation burger and I love their fries. So I wasn't quite as concerned as I was when she first said about she worries about her grades because of college. But, you know, kids grew up in this area thinking that it's only the top students who, who become successful in this world, that their, their, their grades follow them the rest of their life. And so many of the, the kids, especially in high school that I see who are not doing well, in school, they aren't working very hard. There's a lot of conflict about their work. I say, I say you, you, you could flunk. I, I, the first thing I tell them is you could flunk every single one of your high school classes. If you decide eventually that was a bad idea, I want to get an education. You can go to your local community college. You can go to Nova and get, and get 30 credits. And then you can apply to most colleges in this country. And they don't want to see your high school transcript. And I, th th so, and whenever I, some parents say, don't, don't tell my kid, <laughs> but I do anyway, because invariably, when I tell kids that it motivates them, because they're, they're inside thinking, what's the point of trying? There's a kind of dramatic story in, in the, um, in the book about a kid who, um, who was, I saw, he actually, he's one of my uh, colleagues' clients, the parents wanted me to spend an hour with the kid and just kind of get to know him. So I talked to him and and I just, I did a little testing with him. I just talked to him mainly. And he, he told me that he's basically a 2.4 grade point average at, at, at a Montgomery County high school. He says, I do no homework. I, I only do a little bit of work in college, in class. And then I try to manipulate my teachers to, to pass me. And, and but, he, but he told me that he's, he, he was participating in the Montgomery County Rescue Squad. And he was passionate about it. And he was good at it. And I said, and I said to him, not, I had never met his parents. I didn't really know anything about him. I said, am I, am I the only one who thinks you ought to drop out of high school? It seemed like a waste of time. And he's a little shocked. And I, and I told him what I just told you, which is that you, you don't really need a high school to, 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 to degree to, 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 to go to start community college. And, and if you develop the record there, then you can go on. And I told him that there's somebody in my office who, who had just finished a degree in, in, in criminal justice from the University of Maryland. Who started at community college, and um, and so next week I meet with the parents, and I didn't know what to expect because <laughs> they're both they're both university professors, and I didn't know if they're going to want, want to just string me up or report me to the board of psychology examiners. The first thing they said was was thank you so much for having that talk with him. He came home and said I haven't screwed up my whole life. That he said if I if I can't get if I don't get it uh, together here at, at, at this high school I'm at that I, I can go to community college and then I, I go for two years 
the community college, but I can transfer this, the fire right into the fire science program at Maryland. And about three months later, I got a call from the mom saying the kid had a three six grade point average. And what I see his twin, who had always been the high achiever, but the twin was worried they didn't have a passion. And so I'm just saying, I, I, I don't want kids to fail if they don't have to. I want to support, as I said earlier, I want to I want give them all the support they need to do well. But I also want them to understand th that valedictorians by the time that they're 26 or 27, aren't, they, they aren't more successful than other college graduates. That, and so many kids I see, they're just, especially with ADHD, they're just late bloomers. I saw a dramatic change in my own kid between 23 and 26. And, and it's just, it's, it's so phenomenal. And, and if, if, we, if we, can, we, we, try to, we try to support the sense of autonomy and including that sense of autonomy and that brain state that supports it. So they aren't chronically tired, aren't chronically stressed. We aren't chronically butting heads. We respect that this is their life. I can't make them work. I can support them and I can love them um, like that. And I think that's what we want to do. And the last thing I'll say is that we, we close our book um, with a, a line that's widely attributed to Maya Angelou, which is that, that kids are going to forget most of what we say to them. They're going to forget most of what we do for them. What they remember is how we make them feel. And ideally, we make them feel we make them feel supported and loved, but also trusted and competent. And I think that we think that by supporting the sense of autonomy or control, that we can do this in a way that's really healthy for kids, including kids with ADHD. And I want to say a couple of points. One is that I, years ago, I tested the kid of a humorist who said, we really shouldn't call it raising children. We should call it lowering parents because it's hard and it's humbling. Uh, but, but also that, um, that kids can't become independent if, if they don't have a sense of autonomy. And we can start earlier than you think. We, you don't want to wait with the kid with ADHD until, it, until you're fighting with them constantly. You're constantly managing his technology, yanking him out of bed in the morning when he's a senior in high school and then try to go off to college. It doesn't work. We want to be thinking ahead and thinking, okay, and, and some kids, a lot of kids, I, I would recommend most kids with ADHD um, to, to take a gap year. Give, give yourself another year of, of prefrontal maturation if it, if it, unless it's really clear that they're ready. But let's not panic and, and let, let, let's, let's have this goal of kids being able to run their life before we send them off. So I'll stop here and take your questions. Uh, this Irene, I'm just going to pose a couple questions that have been put out there um, or comments. Lots of good comments. Um, let's see. Let's start with um, one. This was really from earlier and commented and then she commented again uh, farther down in the chain here. She said she grew up in a special ed, um, a special ed and no motivation to do anything but follow what her mom wanted her to do. It didn't include learning anything, but she went on and did her education anyway, even though people didn't think that she could. So farther down in the chat, she said this has been really helpful. She wished she had had a lot of the things you were talking about when she was growing up. Well, it, it, it's just, it's counter, in some ways it's counterintuitive because what we think about ADHD is that they need structure and they do. They need structure and support and supervision. But it's just that if we force it, if we think that, that, that somehow we're supposed to be able to force it, we're supposed to be able to make them, it makes us crazy. And, and we, we butt heads with them constantly. And also it undermines the sense that this is your life and I have confidence you can figure it out. And, and, and I, I think that, again, that, that a lot of kids aren't ready. To, 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 they, they need more frontal lobe maturation. And I want them to take a gap year, sometimes two gap years. But I want to be thinking about that I don't want to be working harder than they do. To, to, to figure out their life. And I don't care how ADAC they are, you know, that, that we, we can't year after year work harder than they do to develop themselves because it, it, it will weaken them. Yeah, Liz comment, well, there's several comments, but Liz comment, this is fabulous. just what I needed to hear this week, super helpful for teens. Uh, several folks have asked about slides and, and then any ideas about additional resources? just to help continue to reinforce the, all these ideas? Well, you know, um, I'll say certainly, I, because as I said, I, I looked around for, 
you know, an emphasis, an emphasis or for research on promoting autonomy in ADHD. And I, I found two studies related to learning disabilities, one study related to autism. I didn't find any in, in ADHD, except for the, this Margaret Sibley's new program. And so I get, get the self-driven child. And I'll tell you that I, I, I don't make any money. We, this is so far, Ned and I don't make any money on book sales. So I, I, I don't make any money, but, 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 but certainly I, I'd start there um, about um, uh, self-driven child. Um, and um, I, I think that we, we, we have the self, you can look at selfdrivenchild.com uh, the, the selfdrivenchild.com. We, we, we have a, a Facebook group, a, a closed Facebook group, and Ned and I talk every Friday about a topic that comes up or we answer people's questions. Uh, but I think that in terms of promoting autonomy, or certainly look, read about self-determination theory. That, that's a really strong focus on autonomy. Hundreds of studies on the value of supporting autonomy in kids. Uh, I, I'd suggest that. Um, Sandy commented that you've touched on avoidance and coping mechanism for anxiety. Yeah. Can you offer suggestions on how to help a teenager with his avoidance habit? Because yeah. the avoidance, avoidance seems to create more anxiety. So it's this. So, you know, the, the, it's interesting because there, there's a new, um, so some of you may know that there's a relatively new program for treating anxiety. In, in kids and teenagers that only works with the parents. It's called, the, it, it, it's an acronym SPACE. It's developed out of Yale. And I think it stands for like supporting parents of anxious childhood emotions, something like that. But a, a brilliant guy, Ellie Leibowitz, uh, developed it out of Yale. And the idea is that because, because we're mammals, that when our, that, that when, when, when our, our children, or our babies, and eventually our children, if they're anxious, we, we try to we try to support them. We try to soothe them and nurture them, and we try to protect them from from from, from things that make them anxious. And the challenge is, as they get older, that would make them what they call accommodations like that. It just just tends to make them more anxious because they need that experience of dealing with them on, on their own. And so, and I really I really like um, th th this uh, th this this space program. The, the power of just for parents simply looking at their own steps and saying. Am I, am I accommodating this kid in some way? But by, am I taking, he's avoiding, am I, I, am I, was my putting energy to try to get him to pull him back to work and this, that, am I making it worse? And, and there's so much power in saying, here's what I'm willing to do. But, I'm, but, but instead of focusing on trying to change the child. So I, I, I just look up the space program. It's, it, it, it just Google space, you know, go on their website. And there's, there's all kinds of people being trained in it. Um, uh, I, I was trained in it myself. I'm not going to be doing it clinically, but um, uh, there's all kinds of therapists now. And, you, and the, the Yale website has people who've been trained in, in, in Northern Virginia who, who do it. Um, but but that, that's certainly one place that, to, to look at, at that, that's very sophisticated about if kids are avoiding and we're making some of accommodation, focusing on changing our steps rather than trying to change the kid. Um, Gina uh, mentioned that you you had said something earlier about video games. Maybe okay, so, comment so here's, on it. Here's the thing. It turns out, I mean, video games because the brain develops according to how it's used. Video games actually, have, you know, if you, if you play first shooter video, first shooter games, um, I'm sorry, first person shooter games, you know, these violent games, that the, the the cognitive skills that are required to to, to do the game. Get better at it. with certain kinds of tension, uh, being able to, to to look at that a really complex array of stuff and, and and find the salient details. Being able to shift your attention very quickly back and forth. These things actually get better, and also um, that that video games have been studied from this the self determination theory point of view. Because for many kids, especially if they're playing with other kids, it satisfied that autonomy, the confidence, and the relatedness. The challenge is, and, and Reed Larson suggested this 15 years ago, the challenge is that these games are designed to, to make them almost impossible to stop playing. And so as opposed to, to practicing your jump shot or make, making yours kind of just stick with it and practicing your instrument where nobody's, that it's, it's, it's harder to keep going than it is to, to, keep, to, 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 uh, than to quit. With games, it's the opposite. So what I'm not sure about, I'm just not sure about this, whether the games, the, the, the brain development that happens because the games are so immersive, they're so absorbing that they, it's, it's almost impossible to stop. 
whether that has the same effect on developing that ability to, to go pedal to the metal with other stuff. And I, I just haven't seen it translate as much with, with video games as, as with something else. And I, I gave a lecture last week and somebody said, well, my kid was a big video gamer and I, I think it actually helped him with, eventually with school and this and that. And I said, did he do other things? Well, said, well actually he, he, was really, he was really into to rock climbing too. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not opposed to video games, but I'm not, I don't know, I'm not convinced that they have that same ability to train the brain to go pedal to the metal with other, other things that aren't, so, that, that aren't so designed, they aren't programmed to be so absorbent. One of the questions sort of related to that, well, very related to that is how, you know, uh, sh this mom says that um, my 12 year old, how do I manage um, his avoidance? He, all he wants to do is play his video games. So, so I, I just gave a three hour talk about this yesterday. And um, so let, let me get, offer a couple of suggestions. And one is the, the first thing is that, that many of us, uh, and, that our attitude towards the games is kind of dismissive. And I think that, that, that there's a lot of research that suggests, well, I don't have a lot of research, but, but everybody that I know who studies this stuff says the most, one of the most important things for us to do is to try to understand the kid's experience. So showing, expressing empathy, actually, uh, can I watch you play for a while so I understand this better? Will you teach me how to play? Because we're much better able to help kids, if, if kids are using it excessively, we're much better able without having to fight with them all the time and constantly having to be the message being stop, 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 stop. We're much better to help them kind of understand how to regulate themselves if, if we show interest, if we understand it, um, you know, when, when uh, Minecraft was going crazy, that, um, that I, I gave a lecture and, and a mom said, you know, I, I, was at, I was at a grocery store and at the checkout uh, counter and there's a Minecraft magazine. I thought about buying it for my kid, but, but I, I didn't want to reinforce the habit. But, but my, and, and this goes, and I'll tell you this parenthetically, that the early in my career, I'd see a lot of kids who, who were just kind of obsessed with guns or, and, and this, in, in, play, in, in Blue Maryland, where the, the, the people had made people uh, nervous. And what I saw is, is the harder that they tried to, 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 to tell the kid not to be interested in it, the, the more the kid was interested in it. So I'd suggest you know, spend a few minutes every night kind of looking at the catalogs, talking with the kids, and almost predictably, eventually the kids would kind of lose interest. So my, my sense, is the fir first thing is simply to show interest and, and try to mentor, try to, try to talk to the kid and ask them, are there any downsides? Did you, did you find, or, or how much time did you, did you, did you find that, that you play before you start to feel kind of exhausted or kind of zoned out? And so the, the goal is, is the, the, keep the, it's a long-term goal. And it's, it should be a goal for all of us to, melt, to, to manage technology in a healthy way. And so the goal isn't to get him to, to immediately to stop playing less. The goal is to eventually is to help him figure out how to regulate his own technology. Because again, you don't want to send a kid up to college who hasn't really struggled with trying to manage his use of technology and keep his life in balance. Well, and there's another question very related to that, which was how do you, you know, help with distractions of the phone and TV, which is Similar. I mean, yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, I, I don't know how many of you seen social media. I mean, it's a social dilemma, the, the, this, this Netflix documentary, the social dilemma. But what I've been saying lately is, um, is that there's two things I want kids to know about technology. One is, is, is the main point that is made by the, this, this documentary, The Social Dilemma, which is that the, the current model of the internet is to, to economic model, is to grab your attention including your, tits, your kid's attention, hold it as long as possible, and then sell it to the highest bidding advertiser. And I think that the understanding that they, 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 they don't really care about you. They aren't trying to make your life better. They're, they're trying to sell. And I think well, I want kids to know that. I want the kids to know kind of what they're up against. And you've got some of the smartest psychologists in the world who are working to, to make these products uh, almost impossible to stop. But the CEO of Netflix uh, said about maybe a year ago, so our main, our main competition is sleep. And oh my God, that, 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 you think about one episode comes on right after the next one. And, and I, I promise you if, you, if you have if you have trouble turning it off yourself, if you tend to binge watch, get ready for bed before you watch the, the, the first episode, because it's much easier to stop if you aren't, the, the less tired you are. And um, so in any case, uh, 
was. So I, I think that I want kids to know that, and also I want kids to know that in 2018, 200 psychologists signed a letter to the, to the, the president of the American Psychological Association asking them to censure uh, the censure psychologists working in Silicon Valley who are knowingly using psychological principles, motivational principles, knowledge about the brain to create products that are as addic addictive as possible. So I, I, want to, I want to have family discussions about this. If the kids are old enough, watch, it, watch the um, social dilemma together. What, what are we going to do? Because these people are basically, I mean, kids don't like to be taken advantage of. And if the sense that these people are really kind of trying to, try to, try to, to uh, psych me out, they don't like that. And so what we, what we suggest about, about technology in general, same thing as sleep, make it a family goal, a family goal to regulate, to use technology in a healthy way and not get sucked in so it runs your life. And so we suggest make it a family goal in terms of the regulation of the phone and, and TV and, 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 um, and internet and, and, and talk with kids. Again, as much as possible, talk with kids in an understanding, empath empathetic way, expressing to try to really understand what they love about it and eventually help them understand why it's so hard to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, kids don't want, they don't want their life to fall apart because they're, they're, they're watching uh, one YouTube, uh, one uh, YouTube show after the other or Netflix show after the other. So I think we, we there's some it, comments here. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. Yeah, so we make it a family goal, and and certainly there there are times where if kids are staying up late binge watching, that we don't we don't let them drive. We we have this message to kids, especially as they get older, that I can't send you to college until I see that you can manage your, your technology. And so I think we shift from from when they when they're early when they're young, to you know, knowing more about it, kind of working at negotiating limits with them. As they get older, you know, basically still doing this collaborative problem solving, trying to figure out what's going to work and what's not work, what you can live with and what you can't live with. And eventually letting them kind of figure out what they need to do to manage technology. There's a question, this is all wonderful. Um, there's questions related to school too. I um, comment, every parent in high school uh, needs to hear this presentation. I had teachers and advisors tell my son, if he didn't do better in class, he wouldn't get into college. So that's. I think your message really resonated with a lot of parents. Good, good. Yeah, it's it's just it's 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 just it's so insane. But one of my, I I went to um, to junior high with a kid, actually high school with a kid who in in and in, in, when I went to, to to school, junior high where I went, junior high went through ninth grade, so um, we became friends in tenth grade. But in ninth grade, this gym teacher. Um, was was my friend and, and, and um, some other of his friends were screwing around and this gym teacher, this real macho gym teacher said, you kids can screw around now, but next year you get, your, your grades are going to follow you the rest of your life. And my, literally, my, my, my friend had a nervous breakdown. He had to go, he had to be hospitalized for a couple of days. He was just so panicked about it. And he said something about him, but, 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 but when I learned in 1992 nice. that, that, oh, that, that, that community colleges are completely open enrollment. You don't need a high school degree. I thought, oh my God, they don't follow you the rest of your life. It's the most liberating thing I've ever learned. And I just, I just want every kid to know it. Because right. when kids know that, the, and what I want them to focus on is developing themselves. I don't, want the, I don't care about them jumping through all the hoops to get through public high school. I, I, what I care about is them focusing and putting energy into developing themselves. Now, there are some questions about school and about virtual learning. One was, um, any suggestions on how to help teens with executive function skills, you know, just better organization and planning homework and tasks? Because you did mention, you know, helping with school and study. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of good resources uh, for, for that. I mean, there's so many, there's so many, uh, there's so many good books and uh, about that. And I think, uh, and I th the, the main thing for me, I, I see, you know, so many kids I've seen have, have, have they've been made to take dozens of, not dozens, but you know, three study school courses and they don't, they don't use any of it. You know, and I, I, I think that, that certainly um, Kathy Essig's uh, pr program, her executive skills program is as good as they get. And I, th I think that, that, uh, that uh, I, last time I corresponded with Kathy, she's working on getting a publisher to publish that program. Um, and uh, and I, I think there's the, the main things I think that the kids have trouble with. They, they, we want to help if they're, they're open to it. We help them structure time, space, and expectations. 
and, and be really that, that figure out that the best way for the, we, we use timers about the, the planning we, we asked them i i love the, the idea of of starting beginning with the ending of mind and when, when the kids have a project make sure that, that, that ask the teachers to give them an example of a finished product that it, so we can go through and help them mark up here, here, here are the elements you got to have three sources you got to have a, a main argument and we highlight these things the kid will let us we show, so this is the structure of this assignment and it's a, and, and so let, let's picture here's what it, here's when a finished assignment looks like and then you can like work for the various assessments but this idea of begin with the end of the mind take a picture of what the completed assignment should look like and then go ahead and match the picture, match the model, is really useful for, for kids. Now we have one on remote learning, um, and Ann says that, can you please speak to remote learning? How does, I love you too much, she was coming, she loved your book. How, how does, um, I love you too much to do your homework apply to virtual learning? I mean, for me, it, it just, that it's, it, saying that is, is, is saying, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. Also, I love you too much to fight with you about your distance learning, you know, because it's, it's aligning our thinking with re the reality that it's the kids work and the reality that you really can't make your kid work. And if you really, if, if the truth is you can't make your kid work, then it couldn't be your responsibility as a parent to make him work, right? I mean, it could not theoretically be your responsibility. And so again, I want kids to have all the help that they need. And if kids are really having a trouble, uh, 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 they're really having trouble staying focused and, and so much, there's so much multitasking going on in distance learning because this is so boring. Um, but, but I have conversations with the kids about, is there a way that I can support you? I mean, certainly I, I, I don't I mind you using fidgets. I don't mind you even multitasking a little bit just because I stick with it. But if I can help you break it up, if I can help you brainstorm about how to use exercise, uh, doing push-ups, encourage you to do a few push-ups or something, maybe, maybe, uh, or you know, just to sit and close your eyes for a few minutes. If there's any way that I can help you with this, it doesn't require me trying to, it doesn't require butting heads all the time. I, I want to help. Now, another question that Kathleen asked, which is related to this, is her son is significantly struggling with virtual school, which of course, a lot of kids are really uh, having difficulty and it's yeah. lagging already where he struggled before. They're considering um, repeating sixth grade. Would it be better to wait until he's older just to give him time to mature. So, well, I, I think um, I, I think that what one of the things I want parents to know is that um, is that all everything is easier to learn with a more mature brain. And so, I mean, the the, the generation of, of people who went through. Uh, the, the, span, the, the, the influence ep epidemic of, of, 2000, of, of 1918, then went, th went through, actually before that went through the uh, World War I, then went through the Great Depression. We call them the greatest generation. And I, I, I don't want parents to feel that somehow their kids are going to be scarred for life uh, because the whole world's going through this. And in many ways, the, the, the way we become, we develop high stress tolerance and become resilient is through managing stressful situations. And also, there's, there's a reason that, that kids have to relearn everything that they learn in middle school, um, in high school. And you know, partly because there's, there's so much going on in a middle school development that, they, that they, they just, a lot of it doesn't stick. But the point is that everything is easier to learn with a more mature brain. So I don't, I don't want parents to panic that somehow if my kids are, they're going to fall farther behind and never catch up. But I think we certainly want to optimize um, whatever, whatever we can that they're learning. And certainly, there, there's a lot of high school kids who, who, can, who, can, who have time in their hands to serve as kind of virtual tutors for kids or, or kind of homework coaches or just kind of moral support for doing their work. And in terms of repeating a grade, I mean, I, I'm a, that if, if, particularly if they're male, if they're young for grade, I'm okay with that. And sometimes it, it, it sometimes it makes more sense to repeat ninth grade someplace depending of ideally if they're going to repeat they, they change schools but that's a complex issue because that, that if they're already old i mean there, there's evidence that that if you, you don't want to be turning 19 in the summer before your senior year in high school ideally especially if you're male um, and uh, or even if you're female maybe especially if you're female but either way you know that, that um, that it, it can create some social issues. So it, it, that part is complicated. 
Uh, there's a comment here from Carol. Um, she said, I did it all wrong. My daughter and I fought all the way through seventh to 12th grade. She graduated 3.3, uh, but it was very in, um, intelligent, but she's very intelligent. She started Nova and bombed due to executive functioning and low motivation. She's doing nothing and is, now, is not at Nova now. Um, she's had nothing on her plate, not a part-time job ever since May. She has ADHD and high anxiety. She's 19 and I kind of lost the rest of that, but so oh. how do you, she's 19. What would be of the two or three best things that they could do differently from her, you know, from here on out? What I think one of the things I would suggest is I mentioned this space, this pace program. Um, there, there's also applications of the space program to, to young adults who are kind of, who are kind of underachieving or um, their kind of failure to launch, um, they're resistant. Because you know, and I, I would look for a practitioner that, that, that could help because so, so much of our focus is on trying to change the kid. And really, it disempowers us. And we, we have tremendous influence about changing our own steps and deciding what we're willing to support and what we aren't. And I don't, I make a practice um, of, of um, I, I make a practice of not feeling sorry for kids because I don't want them to feel sorry for themselves. And so, but and I think that as parents, it's hard in many ways not to, we see our kids struggling, it's hard not to feel badly for them. And I think it can make it, make it hard for us to, to, to make choices ourselves that they really, that really need, that the kids need, but that are painful. And so I, I would think about finding somebody who either, either specializes in, in failure to launch or somebody who's been trained in the space program and, and where you can figure out, is there ways that I'm accommodating this kid to make it so, so it's contributing in some way to her not, not working hard to develop herself. Uh, we have a question here that says, um, what are your thoughts on homeschooling for kids with both anxiety and ADHD? You know, I I like homeschooling, um, and and I I I often <laughs> I, I I offered to ho to homeschool my kids every single year, and they actually like school, and and they they, they always turn me down, uh, but I, I I like it, and I I think that I certainly spent a lot of time kind of disabusing my colleagues of the idea that the only way a kid can become socialized is is to um, is to go is to go to school, now. We know that if kids have social anxiety, for example, and, and, and they don't, they, they're avoiding school out of anxiety, that, that the, the more you avoid, the more anxious you get. It, but it doesn't mean that, 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 uh, that every school program is appropriate. And, and so that there are, I, don't, I don't want kids to, to avoid the situations that make them anxious year after year. However, I don't also don't want them to be in situations that are they're, they're just traumatic for them. So I, I, I like homeschool in general, but if I want, if kids are homeschooling and they have some social anxiety, I want to make sure that there's opportunities in, in their week that they're going, that they're with other kids and going against that social anxiety. Uh, another question is what's the overlap between ADHD and trauma, especially regarding brain development? Well, I, I think that it's uh, certainly there's a, there's a, because ADHD seems to be kind of 80% genetic in the sense that, I mean, 80% 80, 80 heritable in the sense that if, if an identical twin has it, that, that there's an 80% chance that the other, other one will too. So there's a strong neurological kind of, kind of genetic basis to it. So most kids with ADHD, it's not because of trauma. However, Certainly trauma, trauma disrupts the most vulnerable brain systems. And the most vulnerable brain systems are the ones that are, that are fastest developing and in, in, the, in the individual, but also the most recently evolved. And so the, 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 the frontal brain system that have to do with, with, with behavioral regulation and have to do with the regulation of attention and the regulation of the stress response are, are affected by trauma. In, in a way that, that can mimic kind of what we just that, that, that genetic ADHD. A Amy Arnston uh, uh, is a uh, studies stress at Yale. She's a biologist. And she says that stress mimics ADHD in the sense that you're stressed, it's hard to pay attention, you, you can't plan, you're, 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 your prefrontal cortex runs on the neurotransmitters dopamine and norepinephrine. 
and it needs a very delicate balance. Uh, she, ca she calls it the, 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 uh, the Goldilocks of the brain because the, the balance of these neurotransmitters has to be just right. And stress hormones will jack up the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine to such an extent that the prefrontal cortex won't work. That's why when you're stressed, your kid's stressed, it's so hard to think straight. It's impossible to think straight and have any perspective on anything. And so trauma certainly could change the brain in a way, that at, least, at least temporarily, can change the way. Brain, these, these systems in, in the frontal cortex change the stress response in a way that, that mimics ADHD. Okay, I'm just looking at the rest of them. Um, uh, I think you're helping a lot of people. As an adult, I've struggled all my life. Uh, hot and cold, now I see it. it, it um, the very few times I've done well, I've been able to summon inner motivation. How can we work on replicating that in our kids and ourselves? Well, in the I, I, environment that we're in now, particularly. Well, I, again, I, I think in, in many ways, given, given this COVID distance learning situation, it's, it, we really have a nice, it really gives us a nice opportunity to focus on these three basic needs, the self-determination theory, which is one of the best supported theories in psychology. That you, to, to have that intrinsic motivation, you have to have three needs. Uh, we lost your voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Just so you know. Yeah, yeah. A second. Uh, yeah. So, so in any case, um, so autonomy, uh, uh, relatedness, and competence. And we, we so with kids at home, focus on the relatedness part. And, and again, and don't don't make the demands of school. Don't take it on yourself. Like somehow I'm supposed to be able to make my kids do this crap. It, it, it's, it, it can't be a responsibility. So don't go there. Offer to help in any way you can, but, but focus on the relatedness part. In whatever, you, in, in ways, wh wherever you can get your kid the message that I, I you know, you're, 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 I see your competence in this area. Do that, 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 that focusing on competence, where you see it. I love that. I love how hard you work at that. This, this makes me so happy to see, to see you practice your jump shot over and over and over again, it, 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 or, or, or build with Legos. It, it, this amazing thing you go, that, that, that I, I love to see that, that, how much you love doing that. You're really, you're really good at that. And it's a competence. And also, we have a lot of opportunity to support autonomy. So but I think that's that I, I love how elegant this self-determination theory is and how practical it is. And I think with, with COVID, I think it gives a lot of opportunities, particularly to focus on that relatedness piece and not go overboard in the competence and achievement. That's great. I mean, and, and a few people have commented just that how that note, these ideas have helped them Good. Uh, personally, uh, let's see. There's some. Great. Thank you. Thank you. There's lots of thank yous. Um, I'm struggling with the not fighting over school. Three out of four of my kids with ADHD basically quit going to school or doing any homework. They're in grade four, seven, and eight. After hearing your talk previously, I've told them that they have uh, the choice because I cannot continue to do their hard work for them, or I cannot work harder than them. And they all decided they want to succeed in school. I just don't know how much to support to give. Um, one yeah. severely lacks any intrinsic motivation. You know, well, it just, it's just, yeah, it's just, as much as they, you know, as, as much as they need, you know, and I, I just, with my kid, with my son with ADHD, you know, I, 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 I offered a lot. And, 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 and even in high school, I, 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 I never, never, ever knew what my kids' assignments were, either one of them, where I, I, I looked at the report cards, but I had, I, I told them I had very little interest in the report card. I was interested in that they develop themselves so they have something useful to offer this world. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would, I would sit, I'd offer to sit with my kid, and, and oftentimes he'd want me to, he'd often want me to, his help, and he want my help with stuff, and, and it was fun. But, but, and it was fun. I always, I always loved it when he wanted my help. But, um, but it was uh, it, it wasn't me saying get get get, this, get your butt in the chair and get this done. Um, and I think think that um, cer certainly also there's a lot of kids who will work for other people who won't work for their parents. I mean, that that I, I'm a big fan of peer tutoring of, of getting a high school kid to come and work with, with your middle school kid or your, your elementary school kid just get them to get get the work done. Um, there's a really there's a lot of research that that kids work they learn really well from other kids. And some of the kids I see who fight their parents tooth and nail, they don't fight older kids. 
or they don't find a tutor or a homework coach. So I, I, I think that um, I want kids, I want kids to work hard. But if, if they're working hard at something, and again, I, the caveat of the video games, they work hard at something. What, what I say to them is that I, I, I love the fact that, you, that, that you, you, you just work your butt off to get, to get good at this. Because what happens in your brain is every time you practice this and do it again and again and again, you're making all these new connections in your brain. So even more of part of your brain is working to, to do this stuff, which is why you get better and better and better. I love that about you. And so if you find some way to support that and, 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 um, and, and stay out of the struggle, the kids generally, they, they want their life to work. Absolutely. Um, there's other comments, but I don't know if we have really any time left. So um, I, I think we could probably go on for another hour. But that's, I mean, I know we're not going to, but. I've got five more. I've got to walk the dog, and uh, but I, got I think five. we've covered most of them. If anybody feels like they still have a question that's not been answered, or because uh, there's so many overlapping questions, just put it put a quick chat in right now, and we'll just see if we've got one or two questions still. I, I, I just saw the, the, one of the questions about uh, a 16 year old who's completely addicted to video games. You know, there. Oh, that was a lot. That just came up. Yep. Yeah, there is a guy, um, there's one guy in this area at least, who's, who's, that's, his, that's all he does, his, his name is Clifford Sussman, S-U-S-S-M-A-N, uh, psychiatrist, his office is in D.C., um, and, um, and he he's, he's completely specializes in, in video game addiction. And I, I do think, that it's controversial whether, whether these behavioral addictions like, like video games or internet or pornography are, are, are really the same as substance, substance addictions. But there's so many similarities in, in, in genetics and in, in, the, in, in neurological uh, functioning and stuff. Um, and uh, I know Cliff feels that the biggest mistake parents make with kids who are really just excessive use, they're lying about it, that's all they can think about, is not treating it as an addiction. Um, and just go to kind of brother therapist and this or that. So I, I, think, I think about at least contacting, look, look at his website, Cliff Sussman, Sussman, uh, yeah, but it is that part of that question is going from like one to a hundred in anger, you know, like on the scale. Is that you know, getting really, well, as part of that comment that you just read, I mean, it, it, it said the, that the mom says that, you know, if she really tries to address it, he goes from one to a hundred in anger and rage very quickly. So right, right. And, and, and there's just got to be strategies to be able to manage that. Yeah. And I, I think that with, with kids like that, you, you need you need a professional who, who knows how to to to, to, um, to to help you be clear about what you can do. And, and you, you don't want to ineffectually be pleading and try to set limits. Again. You want to decide uh, that, that, uh, that I can't live with this. And here's what I'm going to do. And and have somebody who's really supporting you to kind of stand up to the kid. and, and um, the, part of the reason I love the space program is it incorporates principles from nonviolent resistance, where you where you, you get all this blowback when you decide to change your steps, and, and there's a lot of coaching and using these principles of nonviolent resistance to, to handle the blowback and not give in and not and, and not, not escalate the situation. But I think that um, uh, that that a therapist who specializes in, certainly in the space program that focuses on really changing your steps and, and changing your energy. Uh, or um, uh, Cliff Sefflin, who specializes in, in video game addictions, is, is, could be useful. Um, and one, one, I guess the last question then, um, somebody just wanted to, a clarification on Essence, the Essence program, they just wanted to, they didn't get the name that you said, I, executive I, functioning. Oh, the, uh, Kathy Essig. Oh, Kathy, okay, that, Kathy, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, Kathy, Kathy, okay. Kathy had developed her own Excellent program for training executive functioning skills. And she's uh, just for the audience. She's on the chat board, so we yeah, can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, and also, just to let you know that I put her uh, website link in the chat for everybody. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, folks. Thank you. That was fantastic. Lots of lots of um, very good comments. Great. Thank you very much for joining us. And that was fantastic, Dr. Sixrud. And we will send everybody the slides um, in the next couple of days. And thank you for 
shedding some light on this very difficult subject that everybody's dying to know the secret to autonomy in children. And um, we're just very grateful for your time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You're very welcome. It's completely my pleasure. And I'll, I'll send those slides to you folks uh, in the next couple of days. Sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who joined us tonight. And uh, we have one more lecture in our series. I hope you will join us for that. Um, and everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I'm keeping everybody here. Let's see. We got a lot of people to remove. That's more people than we've ever had before. A lot of people did comment that they read your book. Oh, good. I'm going to get, I don't have your book yet. Cheryl has been talking about how great your book is. I'm going to get your book. This is Irene speaking. Everybody um, should read Bill's book. It's beyond amazing. Yes, it sounds, this was an amazing, amazing talk. So thank you. Thank you so much, folks. I, it, 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 um, I, I really, uh, I really had a great time. Bill, would you mind if we put you, um, the lecture up on the chat, Chad YouTube video? Not YouTube at all. Channel. Okay, thank you. Not at all. And um, and I, I, I'm slammed tomorrow, but but Thursday I'll, I'll just I, there's a couple of slides I just I just need to do a couple of minutes tweaking, but I, then I'll just send this off to you. Thank you. It was excellent. All right. Well, be well, you all, you folks. Thank you so much, Bill. We will talk to you soon. Great. Love okay. It. Okay. Bye. 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 bye.